What do former President Calvin Coolidge, the porn industry, and the psychology of learning have in common? Stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone. If you're new here, we make videos on all things psychology. So if that's your thing, then feel free to subscribe and check out our other videos. In my last video on learning, I gave an overview of habituation. So I encourage you to check that one out if you haven't already, because it's going to be relevant to the question of the day. Here on Cyber Society, we only tackle the most important questions. And today we're tackling the question that everybody's grandma has been pestering you about for months, which is, can there ever be enough porn? While it's difficult to estimate how big the porn industry is, there's one thing for sure. It's a multi-billion dollar enterprise in the US alone. A moderate estimate puts it as bigger than Netflix and bigger than the NFL at roughly $15 billion per year. But think about it. How much room is there for innovation, really? The industry prides itself on creativity and variety to the point that Rule 34 of the internet states that if it exists, there's porn of it. Rule 35 follows up, if not, there will be soon. But still, it seems that there may be a limit to how many ways you can depict people engaged in sex. Hasn't everything that needed to be said in porn been said by this point? Shouldn't we have reached a saturation point of more porn than we ever needed somewhere back in like the mid 2000s? It turns out that the psychology of learning may hold an answer. In particular, something called the Coolidge Effect. The Coolidge Effect is named after President Calvin Coolidge. The story goes that Coolidge and his wife were taking tours of a chicken farm, and Mrs. Coolidge was impressed by the uh, fecundity of a rooster, mating with everything it sees over and over again. So she asked the farmer, how long can he do that? And of course, the farmer replies all day long. So Mrs. Coolidge says, would you tell that to Mr. Coolidge when he comes by? Sure enough, the president comes by and the farmer says, hey, uh, the first lady wanted me to tell you that this rooster can mate over and over again all day long. President Coolidge asked, always with the same hen? Well, no, of course not, different hens. Coolidge said, would you tell that to Mrs. Coolidge? This exchange captures a special form of habituation that happens in the case of sexual behavior. Being exposed to a sexually arousing stimulus elicits a strong arousal response, at least at first. But if you keep presenting the same stimulus over and over, the response is reduced. In truth, habituation of the sexual response has been observed in many animals, literally both the birds and the bees. Burying beetles, pond snails, rats, salamanders, lizards, flies, guppies, and yes, humans. In studies with rats, a male and female rat were placed together and allowed nature to take its course. The male can copulate several times in a row until he collapses in apparent exhaustion. You may remember from the habituation video that we must eliminate other explanations of a reduction in behavior such as fatigue in order to say that it's due to habituation. One way to test for this is a procedure called dishabituation, where you present a new stimulus and the response returns. This means it couldn't simply be fatigue. So what happens when our male rat is placed in a new cage with a new female? The response returns and he starts mating again. In other words, this was a clear case of habituation, or the Coolidge effect. How would that work in humans? Well, it turns out many studies have been done. A common procedure is to recruit male college students and connect them to a device that measures sexual arousal through a strain gauge connected to the penis to measure something called penile tumescence. They also, you know, just ask them to rate how aroused they are using self-report scales. It's good to cover all the bases though, I guess, since self-reports are often biased. Now that they're all rigged up, it's time to start presenting stimuli. O'Donoghue and Greer, 1985, presented sexually explicit slides for one minute each for a maximum of 27 slides. The sexual response declined over time, as did ratings of attraction. However, if you increase the diversity of material in the slides presented, you don't get the decline in response, suggesting that it's not fatigue. In another study, daily sessions were carried out with the stimuli over the course of six days. Participants were divided into two groups, one of which was allowed to masturbate after the session. 
The interesting result here is that in the group receiving the sexual reward after the session, you don't see habituation. So that's men, what about women? Well, a number of studies have replicated this effect in women, though others have failed to find habituation of female responses to repeated sexual stimuli. I'll summarize these studies to say that the type of explicit material and hormone cycles tend to make a difference, and there tends to be an overall lower level arousal in the first place, but there is the chance that sexual novelty can increase arousal. Why would this phenomenon be more pronounced in males than females? Some have suggested that it makes evolutionary sense for males who can produce a nearly unlimited amount of sperm to reproduce with as many mates as possible, and the Coolidge effect would help facilitate this strategy. For women, on the other hand, eggs are a finite resource, and childbirth is a costly enterprise. This creates a different set of selective pressures that may promote long-term mating stability, and the Coolidge effect would work against that. This might explain the research finding that men prefer their long-term partners to vary their appearance often, and women report varying their appearance more often than men do. Now, I should note that there are a lot of things we don't know. Most of these studies have been carried out with heterosexual individuals, for example. But back to the question at hand, what about the porn? The Coolidge effect suggests that there will always be a desire for novelty in erotic stimuli. So the industry isn't going to be slowing down anytime soon. It also, however, means the more pornography you watch, the less impact it will have. Now, this could lead to two outcomes. Either you lose interest in it, or you must seek more and more extreme variety to keep up with the satiation. As far as I know, we don't have a clear scientific answer to which of those paths any one individual is going to take, although most authors of early studies of habituation after mass porn exposure, you know, for science, interpreted their results to mean that people will lose interest. There are some newer studies suggesting that the proliferation and availability of free internet porn may cause overall reductions in sensitivity to arousal, especially in men under 40, and that can lead to sexual difficulties like erectile dysfunction. Some clinical reports even suggest that stopping internet porn consumption was enough to alleviate their problems. None of this is surprising in light of the Coolidge effect. So in that sense, maybe there can be too much porn. So that's the Coolidge effect, the habituation of the human sexual response. Thanks Mr. and Mrs. Coolidge for giving us a fun label for this effect. If you found this video entertaining, hit the like button. It's like a tip jar. Subscribe to get more videos on all things psychology. And until next time, keep thinking. Hey, guys, this video with the rooster and the president, everything that can be said in porn has now been said. I think that's it. I think we're done. We can shut the site down. Mission accomplished. We did it. Turn off the servers. Great job, everybody. Pull the plug.